successful evangelism. And we'll take our text in Matthew chapter 12. We'll read verses 18 through 21. And I'll ask you to stand just in honor and reverence to the reading of God's holy, inerrant, infallible word. We find here that Matthew is quoting Isaiah when he says, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he shall not break, and a smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory. And in his name the Gentiles shall trust. Father, <coughs> Lord, thank you for the wonderful presence of your spirit. The blessings, God, that you poured out already in this place. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Now, Father, as we approach the word of God, we know that without the anointing of your spirit, nothing can be done. I pray, Lord, that you'll help people to receive this message. And, Lord, let it do the work that only you know how to do through the message, God, is our prayer. Again, Father, I pray, encourage hearts. There may be someone here today, Lord, that's right now they know in their heart they want to get saved. I pray, Lord, you give them the grace to do that. And, Father, we'll praise you for all that's done in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And you can be, be seated. I just finished a series of messages concerning the glorious church. Uh, the Lord Jesus is coming for a church that's glorious, one without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. And I've poured my heart into trying to help the church understand who we are in Christ. And as doing that, it brought me to the only logical conclusion to that, and that is evangelism. And what I want to show you this morning is what evangelism looks like according to the prophecy that was given according to Isaiah concerning the Lord Jesus himself. Now, he is the, ex he is the prime extreme example of what soul winning looks like, the Lord Jesus Christ is. So we could call him, we could call him the supreme soul winner. Notice on, on, on this side of his being, on, on the, what we we'll call the manward side. Now there is a deity and he is spiritual and he is God. We understand that. But he came here in the flesh to reveal God to us. On the fleshly side, Jesus' main concern, you'll notice, was soul winning. His main concern was bringing people into himself. If you'll notice in, in the passage of Scripture what was said uh, in, in Luke 19, verse 10, he says that, that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. To seek and save that which was lost. Matthew 20, 28, the Son of Man did not come to... He did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So here's, here's what I'm trying to say. I've just shown you who, who you are in Christ. You are the body of Christ. And if you understand who you are in Christ, evangelism gets real easy. Because you realize that everything that God put in Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ has put it into his church, into his body. And I'm preaching to you this morning that the church of God is a powerful institution on this earth. We are not that little old weak beggarly thing that sometimes Satan would try to get us to do because we don't understand everything. We, we, there's things we haven't seen. There's things we don't, we don't really know. But God reveals them to us as we're, as we're ready for them. Now, just a little bit of background here and then I'll hurry right through the message if I can. Jesus had been defending what he had done by his, his disciples going through the field when they're hungry and and picking grains of, and eating the wheat, and eating on Sunday, by all means, on Sunday. And Jesus said, don't you know that the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath also? He's the Lord of the Sabbath. And he went into the, into the synagogue from there and began to, and when he went in, he found the man sitting there, had a withered hand. And so they asked Jesus, trying to trap him, trying to trick him, is it lawful for you to heal this man on the Sabbath day? 
And he, Jesus said, how many of you, if you've got one sheep, wouldn't you, wouldn't you get it out of the ditch? If you've got an ox, wouldn't you get it out of the ditch if it fell in the ditch? And he said, the, the, so it's good to do stuff. It's good to do right and do well on the Sabbath day. And here's what Jesus said. Stretch forth your hand. And here's what happened. When, when he stretched forth his hand, the Bible says it became whole. And I'm going to tell you. Here, here's, here's what I'm saying to you. If you've got a problem in your life, when you reach to Jesus, Jesus can make it whole. He can, he can change things that you think is unchangeable. He can make a difference in your life. And I'm, uh, so, so Jesus has taught us, and we can see by this lesson, and uh, they even got to the point they was going to try to find a way to do away with Jesus. The Pharisees and religious order had got so with him, now we're going to get rid of him. We're going to plan and plot a way to get rid of Jesus. Let's kill him. That basically is what they were saying. And Jesus moved himself away from that. But a great crowd followed him. And what I am so impressed with, that great crowd, Jesus, the Bible says, healed them all. You, you look at that passage. He didn't leave one of them unhealed. I'm telling you, Jesus is the answer to every problem in my life, in your life, and in the life of the world. You say, well, you don't know what I'm suffering. I really don't. But that's not the point. The point is Jesus can handle all that. He, he, he can make it happen. And, and Jesus told them, and now he told the people after he healed them all, he said, don't, don't tell nobody yet. I'm not ready to be revealed. Don't let nobody know who I am. Because Jesus took these poor people and healed them. Now, wouldn't it be something to have the gift of healing today? Now, some people claim to have the gift of healing. Well, if you've got it, I say you take it to the hospital and clear it out. Amen. That's what Jesus did. Jesus healed them all. I'd say, I'd say clean her out is what I'd say. I'd say if, you, if you've been anointed to, with the gift of healing, go heal people. And quit trying to show off. Just go heal people in the name of Jesus. And, and let it be. Let it be like it is. Hallelujah. That'll preach right there now. I want us to notice today... What this prophecy that we just read in our text reveals about Jesus as a soul winner. Here's what I want to put you on notice. If you're going to be active in soul winning and you're going to follow the Lord, you're going to meet resistance. And you're going to be confronted and you're going to, the devil's going to oppose you on every side. You just have to, Jesus did the same. That's what happened to him. He was opposed. He was accused of being a devil himself. He was accused of doing the work by the power of the devil. Jesus had all that and he contended with that. But notice, let's notice what the prophecy said about him. Now this prophecy is what Isaiah spoke in, in chapter 42 of Isaiah verses 1 through 4 is repeated right here in, in, in this passage. Here's what I want us to notice. I want you to notice first of all his appointment. Notice the appointment that Jesus had. In verse 13 it says, Behold my servant. He said, Behold my servant. Jesus was appointed to this place. Jesus was Messiah, the anointed one. He was the one anointed by God to do this very work that he came to do. And when you, when you and I have the anointing of God upon us, that anointing carries on. And by the way, I probably won't get to make this message as clear as I wanted to and as clear as I intended to do. What I'm talking to you about Jesus is this. Here's what happened to Jesus. And I hope after what preaching I've done the past month or so concerning the church, I hope you understand that what happened to Jesus transfers on to you. It's, it's passed down to you. That's what I'm trying to communicate to you this morning. So there's appointment. And Jesus was chosen by God to be the chief cornerstone, precious and tried and true, a precious stone. And listen, you too, as a child of God, you too have been commissioned by God. There's an appointment. Look at Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. Paul says, according as he hath chosen us in him. Now here's what I want you to understand. You've been chosen in him, in God. You just didn't decide one day, well I'm going to follow Jesus a little while and then I'll backslide when I want to. That's not, that's not the plan of God. God. God, when you stepped into Jesus, you were chosen in him. The reason you stepped into him is because God had chose you. And so these things go to, so, so you see his appointment. He said, whom I have chosen. Now see, that, that's what Isaiah said, said about Jesus. 
He said, whom I have chosen. He, he is chosen and precious. Now, I want you to transfer it to this, that you are chosen and precious. Amen. You in Christ are chosen and precious. I realize sometimes we have a hard time getting a hold of that, but by faith, you must do that if you're going to walk where God wants you to walk. You are a chosen people. Paul says, a chosen generation. One that was before the foundation of the world. Now, I know it's hard to wrap your brain around that, but you were ordained in God before the foundation of the world. If that's not so, the Bible's not so. I, I just, it just burn, it gets all over me. I, I'm just so glad I saw that one day. But hallelujah, way back there, God saw me. God saw me stepping into Jesus. God saw me believing in the Son of God. God saw me accepting that precious gift of eternal life from Jesus Christ. And I would just worship him so. Notice also his approval. You know, you need approval. Now, now Jesus had approval. Look at this. The prophecy said, the, the prophecy said, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. Here's what I want to say to you. God the Father is pleased with Jesus. I don't have time to work that a whole lot, but here's what I want you to understand. If you want to please God, you get in Jesus. And you're in Jesus, you're pleasing God. And you, the more you know about Jesus, the more you yield your life to him, the more you'll please God. And God's going to grow you up into the head sooner or later. Ephesians chapter 4, you keep on growing in God, the first thing you know, you'll, first thing you know, you'll grow up into Him, you'll be satisfied with who you are, you'll love like God loves, you, you'll, you, you'll, you'll produce the fruit of the Spirit like He described, like Paul describes. Listen, God's approval was upon Jesus Christ. So if we're going to be soul winners, we're going to have to have God's approval. We're going to have to have His approval. Look at His anointing. Look there in verse 18. I will put my spirit upon him. I will put my spirit upon him. Now let me tell you something. God was satisfied with Jesus. God was satisfied. He, he, put, his, he, put, his anointing, he put his anointing upon him. As a matter of fact, let's back up and get Matthew 3, 17 when Jesus was baptized. Look at this passage. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew 17, 5, said that yet while he spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed him, and behold, a voice cried out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. God has said he's well pleased with Jesus. And here's what you might not understand all that, but here's what I want you to know. When you step into Christ Jesus, you are well pleasing to God. You have done something that pleased God. Now I know the devil fights you on every side. This old fleshly emotion that we have is, is torment to us sometimes. But God, through His grace, will give us strength and He'll sustain us and He'll hold us. I love John 3, verse 34. John the Baptist said this about Jesus. For whom God has sent speaketh the word of God. Notice, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. And here's the interesting thing I learned. The original translation does not put the last two words un, un, unto him. So here's what he's saying. God gives his spirit without measure. How much of God's spirit can you have? All you want. All you can hold. All you can have. God's give it to you. The weakness is our faith. The weaknesses belongs to us, and God wants us to overcome that. Look what he said in Luke 24, 49. Jesus said, I send the promise of my Father upon you. He said, but tarry, tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. That's that, that's that anointing. That's that precious Holy Ghost of God. That's that anointing. Don't you go out to do God's work without the anointing of God resting upon you. No, don't you do that. Acts 1 and 8, but you will receive power, Jesus said, after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses. Not, not you've got to try to be a witness. Not if I work it up, I'll be a witness. You shall be witnesses. 
So if you're in Jesus like you're supposed to be, you're going to be a witness. You can't help it. Why? Because the Holy Ghost of God's bubbling over in you. You're doing what's right. You're, the fruit of the Spirit's bearing out in your life, and you're willing to share that love with other people. You're reaching out to other people. You say, well, what am I supposed to do? Whatever God directs you to do, that's what you're supposed to do. Amen. Don't don't worry about it. You let God make your mind up. Don't you try to decide what you're going to do for God. You let God decide what he, how he wants to use you, and your life will be a lot smoother and a lot better. Don't you try to dictate it to him. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 12, 13, Paul says like this, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. There's not nine different spirits running around. No, there's one Spirit. And we're all baptized into that one Spirit. That's baptism in Spirit. Now a lot of people try to make that a water baptism. I think Christians will be baptized in water, no question. But the spirit baptism is what is, is, is the part that makes us and sets us apart. That makes us, that makes us who we are in God. Now, that baptism gives us the infilling of the Holy Spirit of God, which enables us for living for God, for relationship to God. And here's how you can consider the anointing of God. The anointing of God is solely for the service of God. If you're not anointed, then God may not have anything for you to do right now. But whenever he does put you in a position, he'll anoint you to do what it is he put you to do it. And that anointing will be there. See, because we are the body of Christ, we got the anointing of the Lord Jesus Christ upon us. The Lord Jesus came preaching. Now, notice this. Notice his announcement. He says there in, in verse 18, can he says, he will declare justice to the Gentiles. In other words, here's what he said he'd do. He said, I will bring truth and I will bring righteousness to the Gentiles. John 14, 6 tells us, Jesus, here's, here's, here's what he told. Here's what he told. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now what more does humans need to know than that Jesus Christ is the way the truth and the life. I don't need to get religious. I need Jesus. I need, I need Jesus in me. And let the Holy Spirit of God fill me to the full. So, so that I can be everything God wants me to be. Notice this also. As a soul winner. Notice Jesus' approach. Notice the approach he had. Look if you will. In, in verse 19. He shall not strive nor cry. Neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break, and a smoking flax shall he not quench. See, here's what, here's what that tells us. That shows the gentleness of Christ. That shows the gentleness. And if you're going to be a soul winner, you're going to have to be gentle with people. You can take the truth of God without love, and you can beat people and drive them so far away. See, truth without love won't work and love without truth is hypocrisy so, so there's a balance you see Jesus in his approach was gentle Paul told Timothy 2 Timothy 2.24 and the servant of the Lord must not strive but be gentle unto all men apt to teach and patient Jesus was gentle. And when the anointing of God comes upon you, you'll be gentle when it comes to sharing the gospel with other people. And I want you to understand that every one of you, if you're saved this morning, you are a witness. I have one member of our church that confessed to me, and I regret so badly that it is how it is. But here's his words to me. Preacher Bill, I am a good example of a bad example. My words to him was, Amen, brother, you are. <laughs> but his approach, a bruised reed. A reed was a plant that's hollow and it's real tender. And if it bruises, it can't hardly stand up no more, it lays over. The prophecy said that Jesus wouldn't even, wouldn't, wouldn't even break one of those. 
smoking flax, he said he wouldn't extinguish. Flax was, they used it in the oil pot and it was to use to make a light. And as long as it was in good shape, it made a light. It was like a candle, it was a wick for a candle, so to speak. But then when it got to where it wasn't any good anymore, it smoldered and smoked and stinked your eyes and all that kind of stuff. And so the prophecy says that, that a smoking flax, in other words, that's one that's already passed, it's, it ain't no good no more. But the Lord, the Lord said, I won't even quench it. In other words, the Lord's going to let the gospel be preached. He's going to let it go forth and anybody who will come to him in any time of their life, God will redeem them, save them, and put them on the road to heaven. Look at his assurance. This blessed me. This, 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 this blessed me. In his name, Gentiles will trust or hope. Excuse me, his acceptance. In, in his name. See, Matthew was seeing here that the Jews are not going to accept him. And Matthew was even went ahead and talking about this, this prophecy where the, the Gentiles was going to accept him. And I'm so glad that the Gentiles had the opportunity to come into, the, into Christ Jesus. Because we are all fall under Gentiles unless you're a born Jew, then, you, then you're a Gentile. And you have an opportunity. Why? Why? Because he because of his acceptance, somebody's going to receive Jesus. Now you may, you may witness to a hundred people and only one of those accepts Christ as Savior. Here's my thing. What did that difference that make to that one? Amen. Eternal difference it made to that one. It was worth it. It was worth it. I would say keep on, keep on sharing the Word of God. Notice Notice, notice this, this assurance. It says, till he sends forth justice to victory. There in verse 20. Till he sends forth justice to victory. In other words, all this is going to take place until he sends forth truth and righteousness is going to turn out in victory. And that led me to these passages of Scripture. Romans 8, 35 through 39. And I, I love this. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Notice what he says. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or, or famine or nakedness or sword or peril. As it is written, and we find it in the scripture, for thy sake we were killed all the day long. They carried us sheep for the slaughter. He says, nay, in all these things, get this, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. When trials, tribulations come your way, that victory is yours. You are more than a victory. You, you, it's it just, it, it's like excessive measure of victory is, 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 what, is what the original language says. Paul says in verse 38, For I am persuaded that neither height nor death, that, he, that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, neither height nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Nothing, guys, separates you. Church, listen. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Don't let the devil tell you you can't. Don't, don't, don't believe that lie. Hang on to Jesus. Amen. I mean, if you have to hang on going out of this life, somebody's killed you for your testimony, you, you hang on to Jesus. Just hang right there because, because nothing's going to separate. And, and then listen to you. Now we're talking about until he sends forth justice to victory. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 54. So then... When this corruptible, now don't you know, we live in a corruptible shell. When this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Amen. Now the prophecy said that Jesus was going to bring victory. And I want you to know you're on the side of the victor. You are a child of the living God. You are a victor in Jesus. He said, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of the law, and, and sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Whenever hard times come, don't look anywhere. Don't run to the psychiatrist. Don't, don't run. Listen, go to Jesus. Amen. Fall on your face before God and say, Lord, I'm your child. I need your help just now. And God will see you through. Notice what he says. 
there in verse 21. In his name, Gentiles will trust. That speaks of his acceptance. His acceptance. I love what Paul said in Galatians 1, verses 15 and 16. I hope this means to you what it means to me. But when it pleased God to separate me from my mother's womb and call me by his grace. If you've trusted Jesus as Savior, you've been called by his grace. Why? To reveal his son in me. God has chosen to reveal Jesus Christ in you. Colossians 1, mystery of all ages. Christ in you, a hope of glory. Not head knowledge about Jesus, but Christ in you, the hope of glory. My prayer is that every one of us in this church comes to the point of Galatians 2.20 where we can say together, like Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. I'm dead to me, but I'm alive to Jesus. So how do you know that the Bible told me? How come you believe that the Bible told me? And faith in the Word of God will produce that. He said, but Christ lives in me. The life I, which I now live in the, in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Not my faith, but the faith of Jesus. I'm telling you, we've been transformed into the life of Jesus. Who loved me and gave himself for me. In conclusion this morning, just let me simply say, if Jesus lives in our hearts, And he longs to express himself. Don't you think that soul winning will be a very important part of what you do? Or how you think? You'll say, well, how can I soul win? However God leads you. But you be bold. You know that the anointing of God rests upon you. And when you speak, it's as if the word of God is coming through you. Don't be weak and beggarly. You trust that Jesus is your life. And the power of the Holy Spirit. You may not understand it. And don't go out and expect, I'm going to do great things. I'm going to win so many people. You put notches on your gun handle. No, you won't win any people like that. Because Jesus don't win people like that. No, he, he uses humble servants. He was humble. He uses humble servants. You be sure when God speaks to your heart that you obey his voice. I'll ask you to stand with me.